Chatterjee, Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Retired Kaleem Shokat Saab, Rector Behria, Gunter Pauli, Distinguished Panelists, Esteemed Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. It is indeed a great matter, a great pleasure for me to inaugurate the 9th International Maritime Conference. And I am grateful to the Chief of Naval Staff for having, and the Rector of Bahia University for having invited me. I am sure this conference would prove to be an invaluable forum for renowned scholars, academicians, practitioners, and for the maritime community to discuss, discuss important aspects of the blue economy. We need, a, we need to foster a peaceful international system because in this multipolar world, interdependent networks of trade, finance, communication, and information, the oceans provide more than 90% of world trade as far as value is concerned, and 99% of the routes of international internet traffic go through the ocean. So therefore, the priority, first priority is uninterrupted use of the seas and oceans and humankind must come to terms with its own issues of insecurities, of belligerence, of domination to allow the blue economy to prosper and to live in this world with harmony with nature and I will elaborate on that more so. We need to have regional peace to ensure that our vision of living in peace with the with nature or even to exploit the oceans in our way uh, to help mankind in its requirements of food and energy is important even in, as far as regional peace is concerned. I am also glad to note that the Pakistan Navy is spearheading the development of the blue economy and two joint surveys have been done in this area. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, look at the definition of the blue economy, sustainable use of ocean resources, sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, to improve livelihoods and get and a secure jobs, and for the ocean ecosystem help, to live in health. Now, this is a pyramid which starts with the mankind's selfish interest that we need the oceans to improve our economy, to improve our livelihoods. And the cost which nature has borne throughout is a challenge. Therefore, there are five or six areas where mankind is interested. It's renewable energy, for example, fisheries and food security, transport, of course, tourism and climate change. But let me talk to you from personal experience. All, like all of you, I've been very fond of the oceans and I used to go deep sea fishing in the 80s and 90s. And we got fish enough for us to eat and to share it with friends and it was a pleasure. But over the 10 years, then we used to go into the ocean for deep sea fishing up to the reefs and we found that uh, our catch in the whole day of 16 hours of fishing in the sea became zero. And we realized that mankind is challenging the ocean in a way where it is only looking at exploitation. So my personal interest in between 2013 and 18, when I was a member of the National Assembly, uh, the P Public Account Committee made me gave me a task to look at the depletion of fish stocks in the waters, coastal waters around Pakistan. We were surprised, and I wrote a paper with about 25 recommendations at the end, with good discussions between different provinces of Pakistan, different stakeholders. It took me a year to do that research from Islamabad and visiting Karachi and different other places. And we found that in some areas, there is 90 percent depletion, depletion of fish stock around the coast, coast of Pakistan. And some of, it, some of it may not be recoverable. So that is what is happening throughout the world. 
not exactly in the same proportion, but it is happening. So therefore, this pyramid that we want to exploit the oceans and make sure that the oceans are in hell because we want to exploit them, should be inverted. Mankind is, has been seriously threatened and we need, we need to have a paradigm shift in our thinking. We need to have something I would take out from history as the Eureka moment. Vessels go into the ocean and the physics formulas are based on buoyancy and Pythagoras, when he, when he came upon a possible formula for looking at buoyancy, he was in his stuff and he ran out naked in the streets of Greece, shouting Eureka. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we need a Eureka moment as far as mankind is concerned. And that Eureka moment, the workings of that Eureka moment have been provided by COVID-19. COVID-19 challenged humanity in a, in a way where none of us would have imagined that this balance of nature has been unsustainable. COVID-19 challenged humanity in a way that when we were isolated, we saw in the streets of our country that the sky was not polluted. We saw in Islamabad that the animal kingdom, the monkeys, etc., and the animals came onto the streets of Islamabad because they had been pushed away into the forest. So nature is challenging you. Nature is challenging you in a way that you are, you, we thought for the last 70 years or even 100 years, mankind was thought that the, its footprint on nature is, was negligible, that exploitation of nature is possible and it is limitless. So since the last 20 or 30 years, we are becoming aware that nature is not limitless. You can't exploit nature in your own way. And once you look at exploitation of nature, we threaten bison into extinction. There are a number of areas we started depleting ozone with hydrochloric HFC and with mankind then curtailed. You heard about plastic, we are doing it to plastics. To ensure our food supply, we are cruel to animals. We isolate them, we do not allow cows to move. We withdraw their offspring. We are creating agony, actual agony in the animal kingdom also in its part of nature. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I need to present to you a different approach. I need that to be inverted. I need the health of nature as a primary direction. And exploitation as a secondary direction. Ensure the health of nature. Ensure the ecosystem. Ensure the environment as far as the seas are concerned. And then definitely you will live, live in peace and harmony not among yourselves only. You are a threat to everything in nature. You are a threat to people among yourselves. So therefore, for any direction to be picked up as far as the blue economy is concerned, we must decrease our own insecurity. We, and we intend to exploit the ocean or we intend to exploit all, all of nature. And the regime system in the world today and the nation state concept is more based on the ability to exploit than the ability to live together. So therefore, such conferences are important. Such conferences can give a technical background to what is, what is around and what needs to be done. But at the same time, there, there has to be a will in the international community. There has to, to be a will that humans are no, no threat to you. And to start living in peace, not based on the ability of my force, and my strength to be exploited more and take out a bigger pie in an irresponsible manner from whatever the world has to offer. So therefore there has to be a discipline in all kinds of exploitation. I believe very strongly that in communication, like it was mentioned here, that from Mesopotamia 
to the Indus Valley civilization, there was communication through the seas, and then of course through the rivers. I think for international communication, these are the best sources, these are the best highways that they have to be maintained. I also believe that it, it, tourism can flourish. I also believe that island nations are threatened and something has to be done about global warming. It's a very comprehensive, it is too big for us to understand how nature works. It is too big. We have reduced the insect population of the world by almost 60 or 70 percent, the insect species which was, which was there. We don't even know, we don't even understand how these things come together and how these things work. So let us reduce our own footprint. And that is where, when you reduce your own footprint, other areas of uh, the global economy become important. But global peace, rather than global confrontation, it should be the future. And that is why Pakistan ensures its defense, but at the same time, Pakistan wants to attract the world towards a morality-based international cooperation. And in morality, I also consider the morality of cooperation of humankind with nature, so that humankind may not be threatened. This is a small threat. Don't think COVID-19 is a big threat. This is a small threat. It is just a warning. It's just a warning, unimaginable in an unimaginable way. The entire, just a few days ago I read that the entire mass of the COVID-19 virus will fit into a small can. The entire mass. So with such a small uh, microscopic organism, the balance, maybe nature is trying to restore the balance. Maybe nature feels that the humankind may not understand. Nature is not a thinking animal in the way that we think, uh, uh, the way we think, the way our brain works, but nature has a comprehensive understanding what pain somewhere reacts somewhere else. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe that uh, Pakistan is becoming a geo-economic hub. We, we have been a geo-strategic hub. We are becoming a geo-economic hub with the BRI and the CPEC corridor going through Pakistan to up to Gwadar. And we believe the Pakistan being the shortest route uh, for Central Asian states and for China to export its goods through Pakistan and to be able to import from Pakistan. I believe that the security of the Indian Ocean in all its, its manners is essential for mankind in general, but particularly for the uh, countries in this region. I believe hegemonistic designs in any way deter international cooperation, will not allow you to live comfortably. The, the expression he used here about the seaweed, the ability for 1,000 tons to be produced in one hectare of sea is a very, this, this is just a small part. When we looked into the oceans, we realized for the first time that our own belief that the only way life could live or life could be was with an oxygen carbon dioxide cycle. And when we went deep into the ocean, we found worms who, which had uh, energy cycle based on hydrogen sulfide deep into the ocean. So the ocean has so many mysteries which can still be solved, so much volume that it gives opportunity for mankind to live together with it and even to exploit it for its needs but not irresponsible exploitation, the way the world can be damaged by this. So I must uh, uh, put this uh, thought before you, while you are deliberating on all these things, I am sure that I, we, the politicians and the government are looking into areas where more cooperation can be had without exploiting either country or even nature in that manner. So ladies and gentlemen, in the end, I would like to thank the Chief of Naval Staff for inviting me to this conference. And I assure the organizers and participants of this conference of the unstinted support of the government for the development of Pakistan's maritime sector. I can congratulate National Institute of Maritime Affairs for hosting this conference. I have been in continuous communication with the Ministry of Maritime Affairs, maritime affairs so that uh, 
the future policy of Pakistan as far as the blue economy is concerned is based on a responsible attitude as well as the ability to use the oceans for the well-being of uh, uh, people of Pakistan. I must recognize at this stage the issue when we talk about peace, and I said that policies come from the scientists, policies come from the policy makers, but the will comes from the governments. And when we talk about governments and peace, I must recognize what was expressed by my friend here, the President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, regarding necessity of putting things towards, bringing things towards solution. If we don't bring things towards, issues towards solution as recognized by the international community, we will still be exposing the oceans to, uh, uh, to situations which are not uh, conducive for peace, whether it is uh, uh, the South China Sea or whether it is the Gulf or whether it is the coast along Pakistan. And therefore, solutions based on morality, solutions based on promises to the uh, people of Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, are vital for peace in the region. Without that, cooperation is limited, cooperation is restricted. And the blue economy or the, or the, uh, uh, the brown economy of the nations all depend on peaceful cooperation. So the primary thing is peaceful cooperation and secondarily, we must ensure the fact that this cooperation leads to prosperity of mankind rather, rather than exploitation of mankind. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen for affording me the opportunity of speaking to you on this important uh, issue. Thank you.